So thank you again. I'm going to talk right now about the custom design rules in KiCad. And this feature was added in KiCad version 7, I think. And it is what you need to know in order to do things that would have been impossible with KiCad before. And so setting up the design rules is going to allow you to make better designs, allow you to make more reliable designs, and allow your team to share your designs more safely. More safely? Yeah. Uh, so, how do we do this? The basic design rules are just going to be a text file that contains a set of simple instructions that set up constraints and set up conditions. These two, th these two things from these simple building blocks allow us to create a, a very wide variety of potential rules. And what I want to talk to you about is how to utilize these rules to make your designs more productive. So, when you're out and using KiCad, you tell it to do something. Sometimes it doesn't want to do that. So I'm going to show you how to tell it to do something and make it do that thing that you want it to do. However, there's a caveat. The caveat is that custom rules they're not the same thing as your design rule check. Some of them are, and some of them are not. And knowing the difference is going to allow you to more efficiently create these rules in the way that you want them to behave. So, what we do, some are going to, we're going to set this up in basic ways. If it affect, affects the zone fill, if your custom rule affects the zone fill, no, then it is probably a DRC rule. And what that means is that you put the custom rule in, you won't see it do anything until you run DRC and you get the error or not. If that rule does not affect a zone fill. Uh, well, whoop. whoop. Did, did I lose a slide here? Did lose a slide here. That's all right. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the next slide. Mostly. Not always yes. Mostly. Not always no. If it does affect the zone fill, then what you will you won't get an error in DRC. What it will what will happen is that it will just change your zone fill when you refill the zones. So you have two different rules. You have rules that change what the zone filler does, and you have rules that show up as errors or warnings or something in your DRC. And these are Mostly, it's not always, there are a couple exceptions. So I'm gonna tell you the exceptions as well. We're not gonna leave you alone here. So first, is this custom rule a DRC? Notice down here, these down here, all, any custom rule that affects these things, not DRC. So connections to copper zones, right? Zone fill affects the zone fill, not DRC. Thermal relief overrides, Affects zone fill, affects the thermal reliefs that we generate in the zone fills, not DRC. So again, these, not DRC, because they affect zone fill. Uh, here, not DRC. Again, zone fill. Pad clearance is a zone fill. Uh, 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 not a zone fill, right? Your solder mask ex expansion and your solder paste expansion, not zone fills, but also not DRC. So exception number one, right? not DRC, because what we do here 
These are generated, and KiCad will generate them differently based on your rules. And so if we can just make, them, make it comply with your rules, we won't give you an error. We'll just make it right. We'll make the rules apply to your board. So not DRC. Zone fill. This is your zone fill properties dialog. The entire thing is not DRC, except any rule that affects your clearance, yes, DRC. Yes, you will get an error. If you make a custom rule that changes the electrical clearance properties, you will get a DRC error, and it doesn't matter what if, if you go too close. If you go too close for that, you will get a DRC error. Uh, even, even on the zone fills. Now, what happens? We have a lot, I showed you a couple different ways where you can set different standards, different levels of importance in the rules. And all of these rules interact with each other somehow. It is important to know which ones override what, which ones. Let's see, let me see if I can say that better. It's important to know what is the most important rule. The most important rule up here is the top one. This will override everything. Your board setup constraints override everything in underneath that. After that, any of your local overrides, your pad and footprint properties, these will override your custom rules because what we do the general rule is if it affects everything, then it has a lower priority. If it affects a little teeny tiny thing, then it has a higher priority. Why do we do that? Well, we say, well, if you're making a change that affects just this one little thing, well, that makes, the, you're doing that because you want to change what happens to that one little thing, right? So any of the pad or footprint overrides, they are more important than the custom rules. So custom rules come next. Custom rules here are the next most important thing, and they will override your solder mask and solder paste defaults. A little bit confusing because these are both in the same dialogue, but your custom rules override your solder paste and solder mask. Again, um, we, we like to be able to change those specifically in the custom rules, and then everyone overrides the bottom two, zone properties and, and your net classes, everyone overrides these. So whatever, whatever you have set in your net class properties for clearances, for, uh, for spacing on your, on your matched pairs, uh, these all get over, overridden by, ev by everyone here. But important to know, custom rules get overridden. These are overridden. Um, the board setup constraints are an interesting one. They're at the very top because what we expect you're doing there is you're putting in the limitations of your manufacturer. So you've designed a board and you have a manufacturer in mind. You say, mm, I'm going to have Washoe manufacture these boards. They have these process constraints. If I change the process, my board gets more expensive. So I want to make sure that what I put in there never gets violated anywhere because that would require a process change, right? So the set board setup constraints, that's a baseline. We don't, we, don't let you, we don't let you get around those. If you want to have any of the board setup constraints changed by your custom rules, you need to make them uh, more lenient. You need to make them looser. And then you can use your custom rules to tighten them up in certain, uh, in certain places. Now, your constraints. Constraints set high, a tighter limit than board-wide constraints, right? So what I was just, uh, what I was just saying, you want, you want to make sure those board-wide constraints are fully respected everywhere, and you can, you can make them a little bit, you can make them tighter for certain areas of your board. You want to have your traces a little bit closer together coming out of that BGA than in the, re in the rest of your board. You want to violate uh, your basic uh, width on some, some traces just for a little bit, not for longer than 
two millimeters, you, but you can, you can tolerate it for a small amount. These sorts of things you can set in your custom rules and they will be tighter tolerances than your board-wide constraints. Custom rules also let you generate entirely new constraints that you cannot express with any of the, uh, with any of the graphical interface. And that's, that's where their power is. It also makes them a little bit harder to use. The, it is worth your while to learn the usage of KiCad's custom rules. How do you learn those? Well, you start with what can you control? This list here are all of the different things that you can control. You can set these constraints. Differential pair gaps, uncoupled differential pair length, hole sizes, hole to hole clearances, physical hole to hole clearances. What's the difference between a hole to hole clearance and a physical hole to hole clearance? Well, it's a pop quiz. The answer is that your physical clearance is the physical distance of everything about the hole. The hole to hole clearance is your electrical clearance. So if you have a non-plated through hole, doesn't have any electrical properties, you're, you want a physical clearance, physical hole clearance or, phys or just the physical clearance itself because there what you're saying is I want these actual physical things that don't have any electrical properties to be further spaced, uh, further spaced apart. Whereas just our clearance, our clearance is electrical clearance. So any of the normal clearance ones, right? Hole clearance, edge clearance, um, and courtyard, right? Normal clearance, what, what, or t what we're talking about here is we're talking about electrical clearance and then the physical ones are the non-electrical clearance options. Now, from the constraints, we go to conditions. In the conditions, these are the properties of the objects that you are trying to control. So you don't want all of these, you don't want to change the constraint for, say, all of the zones on your board. You only want to change the constraint for the high voltage zones on your board, right? You want them to have maybe a thicker, uh, a, a thicker width of the, uh, of the thermal reliefs for the high voltage, uh, for the high voltage one. So, or a, a larger standoff between two different high voltage nets. You can limit that by setting up the properties. And the properties are going to be the things that differentiate the object from the rest of the objects on the board. A single property is referred to as A dot property. So A is the first object, and then property is whichever property you want, right? B is the second object. So if you have two objects, you have an electrical constraint between this trace and that trace. The first trace is A, second trace is B. Well, we will put, the, you don't have to write, you don't have to write A dot property equals B equals, equals B dot property and B dot property equals equals A dot property. We do have, we do check both both ways uh, for you, so you only have to write it write it one way. But what you're what you're saying is that between two different objects, I want this property to be true for both of them. So this allows you to set a constraint only on objects where between a trace and uh, a trace from this net and a pad from that net. Right? You can you can set the type of object you're interested in with the property. And you can also, uh, you can also say this only applies if the other object we're looking at has this other property, right? So this allows you to limit scope. Now, useful conditions. These are areas. One of the things you often want to do is you often want to design a different process for a different area of your board, right? You've, you have in one area of your board, you have all of your high speed routing. You want to ensure that this is, uh, th that this is is isolated, this is quiet. You, you have some requirement for the standoff here. What you generally want to do is 
you could name each and every single one of those nets over there. This would take a really long time. Put an area over there. All of these, you, you want to constrain what, what is going on over there? You put, it, put an area and set your constraint to be the area. You place that area on any layer you want, but usually uh, the ECO layers or the user-defined layers are really good. And then up here, give that area a name. Here we're going to make an area called no HV. We want to keep the high voltage, high voltage something out of this area, right? So we're going to set a limit on where that is. With a name, it gets really easy to refer to it because you can say, don't put any high voltage over by my connectors here. Draw the area over by your connectors, name it no HV so you remember which one it is, right? And so, Area, so here we have our first, right? This is only one, one object, A intersects area, no HV. So whatever object you have, if it intersects the area, no HV, and its net class is HV, what are we doing here? We're setting a constraint that is just an assertion. An assertion says, I have to be true. If I hit this, I have to be true. We're saying the assertion is false. So if the condition is true, this raises a DRC error, always, every, every time. So setting up an, an assertion that is, that is false gives you a quick way to make a, a DRC error. Now, whoop, there we go. I've got two different rules here. This is kind of like one of those spot the difference puzzles. We have two different things here. The difference here is we have intersects area in this one, and this one's enclosed by area. Two different, two different types of ways of interacting with, with that area. You wanna make sure it's all the way inside the area, enclosed by area is your, is, is your command that you want. Intersects area is anything that even touches. Anything that even touches. And with footprints, that means any object in the footprint um, that, in, that intersects with the area is going to end up being true for this, for this constraint. Look out for your overrides. Remember the hierarchy diagram that I showed you where you have things that still override your custom rules. This might catch you out. This might trick you, cause you to make a mistake because maybe you didn't make the footprint that has the override. Maybe, maybe your team member made that annoying footprint that has the override and you didn't know about it because it's down in the footprint. So make a rule. Make a rule that looks for this and checks to make sure your expectation is true. How do you make that rule? I keep going backwards. There we go. Make a rule that says, I need to make sure that there are no overrides. This rule just says that anything, any pad, that has a zone connection style that is not inherited is going to cause an assertion, right? Constraint assertion. I'm going to say that this has to be true. Zone connection style equals inherited has to be true. This prevents the override. If there's an override, if my team member who made this footprint, put that in there because they needed it. I don't make a mistake in my board by, use, by using that footprint without knowing about it. DRC will save your skin in this sort of situation. And I'm still going backwards. There we go. All right, here's another one. Overlapping components. Sometimes, Notice what we have here. We have two different options for our oscillator, X3 down on the bottom and X4. Sometimes we'll want to put this into a board where we allow different options based on, uh, based on different circuit characteristics or, man or manufacturer availability. We want to allow that in there, but we don't want to use up extra space on the board so I have them overlapping. You can see the outline of X3 is this 
large package and the outline of X4, I've put them overlapping here. I'm never going to put both of them on the board at the same time, but DRC doesn't know that. DRC is going to give you an error there. But you know that, so you can tell DRC, I don't want an error there. Right? I know that if they are not, so here, if they, if one of them says do not populate and the other one doesn't, it's fine. Only one's going in. Don't worry about the overlaps. It's only worry about the overlaps if they're both being populated. So here, this gives us the ability to, uh, to tell our board uh, that this is okay, that this, that this overlap is okay. What else can you do? You can also keep your footprints away from, uh, uh, away from the edge, edge of the board because you know that you're going to put this into, into a rack. You need to have some standoff, some clearance. You want to keep, keep them safe. You don't always do all of the layout. Maybe you are working with a team and you, you know that you are going to be a really good layout person, but you're not sure about this person over here. Put a rule in there. Put a rule in there that's, that in effectively describes what you want to have happen, right? Effectively describes your limitation and then the rest of your team can do whatever they want, you're gonna check it and you're going to, you'll be able to check it automatically with the, uh, with the DRC. Sometimes you do want to overlap a non-plated through hole with, with a pad. So examples of, of this type of behavior you'll see in, uh, you'll see in boards that they don't want to actually have the solder on the, uh, on the solder side of the board. If, if that makes sense, we used to call the bottom side the solder side. So you don't want to have solder flowing through the hole, but you still need to put a component there. We don't actually support this because it's, it's pretty uncommon, but you can make us, you can make KeyCAD support this, right? Non-played through hole allow, easy, easy peasy. Set up, set up a rule that says, for this component here, I want to allow hole clearances that are smaller than the, ex than the expected. What I've said here, I've said the minimum hole clearance is negative. Obviously, you can't have a negative clearance. Clearance is absolute. So when you set a negative, you gotta turn it off. So that turns off the hole clearance if the two parents are the same and we are inside the courtyard. So all of the non-plated through holes that you put in that footprint are going, are going to be allowed here without setting up a, a DRC error. Silk screen. Silk screen can cause a problem. If you don't have a mask here, this top of this silk screen, you're not gonna see it. You put it down here, but your colleague, you know, they are trying to route something, so they're like, ah, oh, this is in the way. I'm gonna move it up here and forgot about it. Now, you're not going to have your, war your warning symbol anymore and you're not going to pass your certification if you don't have the prop proper, uh, proper warning, warning symbols there. So this rule lets you prevent silk from overlapping areas with the, with the mask. So here the rule says run silk over pads. So the constraint is the silk clearance. I want to have at least a tenth of a millimeter in between the silk, anything that exists on layer F, so F star. I don't care what the F star is, right? This is all the layers that start with the letter F. And B, the one I'm comparing it to, is on mask. So anything on the front layer that overlaps with the mask, the mask should be all by itself. So anything that exists on the front layer overlaps the mask is going to trigger this one. And on the back layer, we do the same thing here. The star globbing is, is very useful because you can use that to shortcut. You don't have to write rules that trigger on every single net that starts with, uh, with high voltage. Every single net that starts 
in, if you have a 32-bit bus, all of your net names for that 32-bit bus, they're probably going to be pretty similar. If you want to set up a rule that triggers all of those nets, you want to use your star globbing. So star globbing catches, catches multiple objects um, that start or, or end. You can, put, uh, you can put the star at the beginning as well. Now, this right here, you might not know about. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. There are example rules in KiCad. So apart from the ones I've shown you, there are dozens and dozens more rules that you can just use in your designs or you can use as inspiration in your designs and they're hidden up here. Board setup in the DRC rules, there's a little link here, top right hand corner. Don't be fooled because when you open it up, it looks like this and we call it syntax help. So you might expect that it just tells you about the syntax and you would not be wrong in that. We do tell you about the syntax. This is the top, but you have to scroll down. Wait, no, scroll down more. No, no, keep going, keep going. Oh, there we go. Ah, all right. These are the basic rules. Now, if you want the advanced rules, you have to keep going down further and further. Oh, how did I? Did I? Yeah, what? I should have multiple ones on here. There are lots more rules down there. So in this, in this section, look for the rules. They are all over there. And then we have a large section of example rules down at the very bottom that you should feel free to utilize. Just copy and paste them right, in, right into your rule, uh, right into your custom rule file. So uh, with that, I'm finished with upgrading your custom rules. Please let me know if you have any questions. Any, any questions? Very awesome to see those rules uh, in KiCad now. I have one question. There's basically the constraint uh, section and then the condition. The condition appears to me like a, a selector of which objects I want to check or constrain. Okay, so let's, let's pick out, um, so this, this, the constraint or the condition? The, the condition. The condition. The, uh, the condition can be lengthier than two checks, I guess, so. Is the condition can be as many conditions as you want. So here I have two checks and I'm, I'm combining them with and. Mm -hmm. You can also use or if you want. Mm -hmm. Or is two vertical pipes. Mm -hmm. So you, you can do ors. All logical operators are, Boolean logical mm -hmm. operators are supported here. And you can also nest them. So uh, if you wanted this, these two to be evaluated first, put them in parentheses. You'll eval we'll evaluate them as you would expect with parentheses get evaluated first and then outside of the parentheses get evaluated a after that. So yeah, yes, you, you can build up as many of these conditions as you, as you want to get the exact object you're looking for. Awesome. Uh, one question or a second question. Is it possible to like form conditions and reference to those from other rules, like like mock, macros or f like f like basically set up a condition and then reuse that condition to be true and add some more. Not right now. Not yet. Okay. Not, thanks. Not, not right now. That I don't think we actually have an issue that's tracking that feature request. So please sure. write that. Do, like do sure. the, do the report a bug, and put put that in there because that sounds really useful and I bet once you put it in there a couple other people are going to say yeah you know I would use that so um, in order to do that we you know we, we have the name here and we could um, we could have an additional uh, an additional command that would reference it, it wouldn't be too hard to put in but we didn't think about it yet right. so thank you for the cool. good idea. Cool. That. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? So I have a question, a very simple question. Can you go back to the priority page uh, in the early page, I see? Oh, I'm very going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. There we go. The override when I, sequence, when I, want I see. I want to go one way. There we go. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very simple question. You said, so the board setup constraints is of the highest priority, right? 
Correct. So, so for, for example, the, uh, the trace width is set as uh, point, point 0.2 millimeters, mm. and I then have a customer rule for the BGA area, and I set it probably uh, point 0.1 millimeters. So by that time, actually what I need is uh, the track width within that area is point 0.1 millimeters. Mm. So it, it looks to me that customer rule should have a higher priority than the for a set of constraints. Like, am I wrong, or, or how do you define this priority? Right. So that priority, we define the board setup constraints as the minimum value that your manufacturer is willing to ac accept for your board. So if you put a value in there, that's the one that it w you are saying that this is the limit and it doesn't matter what anyone else changes, that, that is the ultimate limit. And we need to have something that stops a modification from, uh, from, from, from happening there. We need to have some way for a manufacturer to say, put these rules, put these rules in here because this is, the, these are our physical constraints. In that case, if you have a customer who just wants a BGA trace width of, of violating the manufacturing constraint, but only for just a little bit, then you need to set that as the limit. That's the actual manufacturing limit, and then have net class trace width or, or a custom rule trace, trace width for the rest of the board that, that, that you're willing to accept. Okay. Some different define from other yeah. EDO, oh, definition in, from uh, EDO tools. In, yeah. in, interestingly enough, um, custom rules, you can have multiple custom rules, right? We evaluate these in uh, reverse order, first one wins. So the last rule that you write is the most important rule. So if you have two rules that each set the trace width, for instance, then the second rule, the one that's further down on the bottom, that's the one that we're going to go with. Because we say, hmm, well, that's going to be the most recent one that you wrote, because you're writing the file from top to bottom, so that, you know, that's, that's the one that we want. Okay. So uh, if you want to override something higher up, you can make it more specific lower down. Yeah, okay, that answers my second question, how to define the priority mm -hmm. of different customer rules. Yes. Okay, thank you. So any? Oh. I have two questions. Uh, one is the uh, constraint types. Is for screw, screw constraint type. Uh, I remember in CAD uh, to do less matching, uh, CAD calculates the less, uh, the less uh, may be wrong if the if the if the trace across a a, a pad. Okay, it, it may uh, calculate wrong the less. Mm. It have different in. Uh, remember the uh, track class and the uh, net class inspector, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, so the screw, the pr uh, if I constrain the screw, uh, it, it is uh, affected by by the calculation of the the length. Is the skew affected by the calculation of the length? Is that yeah, your question? Yeah. Uh, yes. So, in order to, however, with skew a little bit easier because we're doing the same calculation with both, right? And so um, we have improved the length calculation and unified the length calculation so you don't see two different ones depending on if you're in DRC versus if you are in the router. We used to have two different ones that were slightly different and you could get different cases uh, depending on wh where you were checking it, that's gone. That's gone now. We've we've unified all of those length matching options in, into one, and we have fixed the length in pad. Um, however, it is still only just the uh, the single net length matching, and we don't do the uh, the t the t matching or the branch branch matching uh, branch matching yet. But look for that in in version nine. My, my second question is, uh, can I design a custom rule or uh, design a custom rule to 
to help me to design the lens mesh, I can yes. uh, constrain the, the lens mesh. Using yes. Net, uh, compare compare uh, net, net link or compare the net graph. Correct. To, to uh, calculate the lens uh, subtract. Correct. Uh, so let's say you are uh, you're routing uh, a, a bus, right? Yeah. A, a bus. Uh, yeah. You're going to a, a dim module or something like that, and you want to link match the uh, all, all the the bus lines in there. You can set up the custom rule mm -hmm. to say all of these lengths. Mm -hmm. So if the if the net name starts with, mm -hmm. or the net name is, um, you know, dim module one underscore star, then length equals um, equals cert a certain value. And uh, one thing I didn't cover here is that length allows you to set your optimal, your minimum, and your maximum. And so you can set you can set a range in there for which uh, you know how much variation you're willing to accept in the length tolerance. Correct. The min 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 max optimal gives you uh, gives you the 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 vari vari variance in the length that you're routing. Great. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you, Seth. Thanks.